Dear friends, welcome back to my channel. Let's read. Yesterday we had started reading the story Lihaf written by Isma Chuktai. So let's complete the story today. Part 2 Lihaf. The fact of the matter was that the Begum Jan was afflicted with a perpetual itch. Numerous oils and lotions had been tried, but the itch was there to stay. Hakims and doctors stated, "It is nothing." the skin is clear but if the disease is located beneath the skin it's a different matter these doctors are mad rabbu used to say with a meaningful smile while gazing dreamily at begum jan may your enemies be afflicted with skin disease it is your hot blood that causes all the trouble rabbu she was a black as begum jan was white like burnt iron ore her face was slightly marked with small pox her body solidly packed small dexterous hand a tight little paunch and full lips slightly swollen which were always moist a strange bothersome odor emanated from her body those puffy hands were as quick as lightning now at her waist now her lips now nedding her thighs and dashing towards her ankles whenever i sat down with begum jan my eyes were riveted to those hands winter or summer begum jan always wore hyderabadi kurtas i recall her dark skirts and billowing white kurtas with the fan gently rotating on the ceiling begum jan always covered herself with a soft wrap she was fond of winter i too liked the winter season at her house she moved very little reclining on the carpet she spent her days having her back massaged chewing on dry fruits other household servant were envious of rabbu the witch oh just look she ate sat and even slept with begum jan rabbu and begum jan the topic inevitably cropped up in every gathering whenever anyone mentioned their names the group burst into loud coughs who knows what jokes were made at their expense but one thing was certain The poor lady never met a single soul. All her time was taken up with the treatment of her unfortunate itch. I have already said that I was very young at that time and quite enamored of Begum Jan. She too was fond of me. When mother decided to go to Agra, she had to leave me with somebody. She knew that left alone I would fight continuously with my brothers or wander around aimlessly. I was happy to be left with Begum Jan for one week. and begum jan was equally pleased to have me after all she was ammi's adopted sister the question arose of where i was to sleep the obvious place was begum jan's room accordingly a small bed was placed alongside the huge four poster until 10 or 11 that night we played chance and talked then i went to bed when i fell asleep rabbu was scratching her back filthy wench I muttered before turning over. At night I woke up with a start. It was pitch dark. Begum Jan's quilt was shaking vigorously as if an elephant was struggling beneath it. Begum Jan, my voice was barely audible. The elephant subsided. What is it? Go to sleep. Begum Jan's voice seemed to come from afar. I'm scared. I sounded like a petrified mouse. Go to sleep. Nothing to be afraid of. Recite the ayat ul kursi. Okay. I quickly began the ayat, but each time I reached yalamu mabain, I got stuck. This was strange. I knew the entire ayat. May I come to you, Begum Jan? No, child. Go to sleep. The voice was curt. Then I heard whispers. Oh God, who was this person? Now I was terrified. Begum Jan. Is there a thief here? Go to sleep, child. There is no thief. This was the voice of Rabbu. I sank into my quilt and tried to sleep. In the morning, I could not even remember the sinister scene that had been enacted at night. I have always been the superstitious one in my family. Night fears, sleep talking, sleep walking were regular occurrence during my childhood. People often said that I seemed to be haunted by evil spirits. Consequently, I blotted out the incident from memory as easily as I dealt with 
all my imaginary fears. Besides, the quilt seemed such an innocent part of the bed. The next night, when I woke up, a quarrel between Begum Jan and Rabbo was being settled on the bed itself. I could not make out what conclusion was reached, but I heard Rabbo sobbing. Then there was sound of a cat slobbering in the saucer. To hell with it, I thought and went off to sleep. Today, Rabbo has gone off to visit her son. He was a quarrelsome lad. Begum Jan had done a lot to help him settle down in life. She had bought him a shop, arranged a job in the village, but to no avail. She even managed to have him stay with Nawab Sahib. Here he was treated well. A new wardrobe was ordered for him. But ungrateful wretch that he was, he ran away for no good reason and never returned. Not even to see Rabbo. She therefore had to arrange to meet him at a relative's house. Begum Jan would never have allowed it, but poor Rabu was helpless and had to go. All day Begum Jan was restless. Her joints hurt like hell, but she could not bear anyone's touch. Not a morsel did she eat all day long. She mopped in bed. Shall I scratch you, Begum Jan? I asked eagerly while dealing out the deck of cards. Begum Jan looked at me carefully. Really? Shall I? I put the cards aside and began to scratching while Begum Jan lay quietly, giving in to my ministrations. Rabu was due back the next day, but she never turned up. Begum Jan became irritable. She drank so much tea that her head started throbbing. Once again, I started on her back. What a smooth slab of a back. I scratched her softly, happy to be of some assistance. Scratch harder. Open the straps. Begum Jan spoke. There, below the shoulder. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. She sighed as if with the immense relief. This way, Begum Jan indicated, although she could very well scratch that part herself. But she preferred my touch. How proud I was. Here, oh, how you tickled, she laughed. I was talking and scratching at the same time. Tomorrow I will send you to the market. What do you want? A sleeping walking doll? Not a doll, Begum Jan. Do you think I am a child? You know I am. Yes, an old crow. Is that what you are? She laughed. Okay then, buy a babua. Dress it up yourself. I will give you as many bits and pieces as you want. Okay? She turned over. Okay, I answered. Here, she was guiding my hand whenever she felt the itch. With my mind on the babua, I was scratching her mechanically, unthinkingly. She continued talking. Listen, you don't have enough clothes. Tomorrow I will ask the tailor to make you a new frock. Your mother has left some material with me. I don't want that cheap red material. It looks tacky. I was talking nonsense while my hand roved the entire territory. I did not realize it, but by now, Begum Jan was flat on her back. Oh God, I quickly withdrew my hand. Silly girl, don't you see where you are scratching? You have dislocated my ribs. Begum Jan was smiling mischievously and I was red with embarrassment. Come, lie down with me. She laid me at her side with my head on her arm. How thin you are. And let's see your ribs, she started counting. No, no, I protested weakly. I won't eat you up. What a tight sweater, she said. Not even a warm vest. I began to get very restless. How many ribs? The topic was changed. Nine on one side, ten on the other. I thought of my school hygiene. Very confused thinking. Let's see, she moved my hand. One, two, three... I wanted to run away from her, but she held me closer. I struggled to get away. Begum Jan started laughing. To this day, whenever I think of what she looked like at that moment, I get nervous. Her eyelids became heavy, the upper lip darkened, and despite the cold, her nose and eyes were covered with tiny beads of perspiration. Her hands were stiff and cold, but soft, as if the skin had been peeled. She had thrown off her shawl and in the karga kurta, her body shone like a ball of dough. Her heavy gold kurta buttons were open, swinging to one side. The dusk had plunged into her room like a claustrophobic blackness and I felt 
gripped by an unknown terror. Begum Jan's deep dark eyes focused on me. I started crying. She was clutching me like a clay doll. I started feeling nauseated against her warm body. She seemed possessed. What could I do? I was neither able to cry nor scream. In a while she became limp. Her face turned pale and frightening. She started taking deep breaths. I figured she was about to die, so I ran outside. Thank God, Rabbo came back at night. I was scared enough to pull the sheet over my head. But sleep evaded me as usual. I lay awake for hours. How I wished Ami would return. Begum Chan had become such a terrifying entity that I spent my days in the company of household servants. I was too scared to step into her bedroom. What could I have said to anyone? That I was afraid of Begum Chan? Begum Chan, who loved me so dearly. Today, there was another tiff between Begum Chan and Rabbo. I was dead scared of their quarrels because they signaled the beginning of my misfortunes. Begum Jan immediately thought about me. What was I doing wandering around in the cold? I would surely die of pneumonia. Child, you will have my head shaven in public. If something happens to you, how will I face your mother? Begum Jan admonished me as she washed up in the water basin. The tea tray was lying on the table. Pour some tea and give me a cup. She dried her face and hands. Let me get out of these clothes. While she changed, I drank tea. During her body massage, she kept summoning me for small errands. I carried things to her with utmost reluctance, always looking the other way. At the slightest opportunity, I ran back to my perch, drinking my tea. My back turned to Begum John. Ami, my heart cried in anguish. How could you punish me so severely for fighting with my brothers? Mother disliked my mixing with the boys as if they were man-eaters who would swallow her beloved daughter in one gulp. After all, who were these ferocious male? None other than my own brothers and their puny little friends. Mother believed in a strict prison sentence for females, life behind seven padlocks, Begum John's patronage, however, proved more terrifying than the fear of the world's worst gundas. If I had the courage, I would have run out onto the street. But helpless as I was, I continued to sit in that very spot with my heart in my mouth. After an elaborate ritual of dressing up and scenting her body with warm uthers and perfumes, Begum Jan turned her arduous heat on me. I want to go home, I said in response to all her suggestions with more tears. Come to me, she waxed. I will take you shopping. But I had only one answer. All the toys and sweets in the world kept piling up against my one and only refrain. I want to go home. Hurry, your brothers will beat you up, you witch. She snagged me affectionately. Sure, let them. I said to myself, annoyed and exasperated. Raw mangoes are sour, Begum John. Malicious little Rabbu expressed her views. The Begum John had her famous fit. The gold necklace she was about to place around my neck was broken to bits. Gosamir net scarf was shredded mercilessly. Here, which were never out of place, were tossed with loud exclamations of, Oh! And she started shouting, convulsing. I ran outside. After much ado and ministration, Begum Jan regained her consciousness. When I tiptoed in the bedroom, Rabbu propped against her body, was kneading her limbs. Take off your shoes, she whispered. Mouse like I crept into my quilt. That night, Begum Jan's quilt was once again swinging like an elephant. Allah! I was barely able to squeak. The elephant in the quilt jumped and then sat down. I did not say a word. Once again, the elephant started convulsing. Now I was really confused. I decided, no matter what, tonight I would flip the switch on the bedside lamp. The elephant started fluttering once again as if about to squat. Smack, slobber, someone was enjoying a feast. Suddenly, I understood what was going on. Begum Jan had not eaten a thing all day and Rabbo the witch 
was a known gluten. They were polishing off some goodies under the quilt for sure. Flaring my nostrils, I huffed and puffed, hoping for a whiff of the feast. But the air was laden with atar, hina, sandalwood, hot fragrances and no food. Once again, the quilt started billowing. I tried to lie still, but it was now assuming such weird shapes that I could not contain myself. It seemed as if a frog was growing inside it and would suddenly spring on me. Ammi! I spoke with courage. But no one heard me. The quilt, meanwhile, had entered my brain and started growing. Quietly creeping to the other side of the bed, I swung my legs over and sat up. In the dark, I groped for the switch. The elephant somersaulted beneath the quilt and dug in. During the somersault, its corner was lifted one foot above the bed. Allah! I dove headlong into my sheets. What I saw when the quilt was lifted? I will never tell anyone, not even if they give me a lakh of rupees. Dear friends, this is the end of one of the famous short stories written by Isma Chuktai, The Quilt, also known as Lihaf. Dear friends, if you really like the collection of my stories, please do not forget to like, share and subscribe the channel. Stay tuned for more such collections and uh, maybe tomorrow from the timeless collection of Sadat Manto, we'll read something.